I guess this one will technically be the last one for the summer. Um, uh, as we have gone through, uh, it's hard to believe, 24 weeks of this lesson. Uh, it's hard to believe. It's, but it's, a tw it's uh, 12 lessons and we've been watching the videos in between. Actually, it's been longer than 24 weeks because we had a few special Sundays and uh, it got bumped. But uh, we're glad that you are, are here and part of uh, uh, this time that we can have together. Uh, as we uh, focus this morning, we're going to be looking at the last chapter, um, which is typically called the end. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 13 is our focus this morning. Did everyone get an opportunity to watch the video online, David Jeremiah? I uh, hope you did. Uh, uh, if not, that uh, you were still able to work through the questions. Um, so in this lesson, we're going to see the prophecies of the end and the end of Daniel's prophecies. Um, and uh, look at our questions. But before we go into uh, the questions, let's just watch this little video clip again uh, from David Jeremiah. had come and gone, yet Daniel continued. So who was this man whose legacy inspires us still today to stand up and remain people of God, even in a godless world?
let's uh, take our books and uh, go to the next slide here. So we're on pages 132 of our uh, workbooks. And as we review this morning, let's begin by looking at the first question at the top of page 132. What role of Michael the Archangel was described in Daniel verse 1? And maybe before we answer that, if we could have someone turn and uh, read Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. So like that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will rise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So how would we answer this question based on that Bible verse? He was a protector of God's people. Right, he was a protector of God's people. God's people as like an, almost a guardian angel, right? Uh, he is referred to as this great prince uh, over Egypt, I mean over Israel. And remember how that ties into some of the previous lessons, how, or especially even the, the previous lesson, how the prince of um, uh, Persia, or the kingdom of Persia, was a demon that actually had authority over a particular area. Uh, Michael's authority was over not an area uh, necessarily, but a, a people, uh, but also primary uh, Israel, um, but the people of Israel. So the next question that we have is, what does this standing up in heaven that we heard in that passage uh, imitate on earth? How did you feel that? standing up in heaven Im uh, what imitated on earth. What did that mean? The beginning of tribulation. The last half. Yeah, the last half. It, 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 the standing up is it referred to as the, the last uh, three and a half, I believe. Um, it, it was like he was ready for mission. But I think the last half that adds to the next question, um, because it is, what does Jeremiah 30 verse 7 call this period? And uh, so let's have somebody read Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be, at a, uh, it will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. So what, what does he call this period of time? in that passage. Jacob's trouble. J Jacob's trouble, right. Jacob's trouble. And it, it is, uh, Jacob's trouble, I did some research on that term in Jeremiah, and it, it, it shares the context of uh, other phrases that are found within Scripture, the great day of the Lord, or the day of the Lord, or even a time of trouble. It, it all lines up with passages like, uh, Zephaniah 1.14 and Amos 5.8 that talk about this, this great time of trouble that will come upon uh, the world. And uh, it's, it is speaking about this time that Daniel is referring to in this passage. But we're more specifically needing to look at the next question that says, what does this name Jacob signify? And to whom does Jacob refer? Because again, it's called the, the Jacob's Trouble or the Day of the Lord. But what does this signify? I, I think it's referring to the nation of Israel, the people. It is partly referring to the nation of Israel, you're right, because Jacob, the word Jacob, refers to a remnant within Israel. So, so when we call, talk about Jacob's Trouble, it is referring to the people of Israel because even the name Jacob refers to remnant in Israel. <laughs> Any other things that you got out of that uh, verse in regards to Jacob's trouble? What does it signify or what is it? 
we know we know it's the last three and, a half, and this is what Debian referred to as the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, which is the tribulation period. Um, the word Jacob not only uh, refers to a remnant of Israel, but the definition of the word Jacob, as I looked it up in a number of concordances, is, and this was unique, I, I didn't see this before, Jacob, the meaning of Jacob is the heel catcher. The heel catcher. And, you know, even as we talked about Satan this morning and what Christ will do, he is the, this is the heel catcher. Um, and, and so it, it just ties in a little bit more of, of God's overall knowledge of what will take place in our world, even in days to come. Isn't that because he came out holding Esau's heel? Yeah, that's part of it, yeah. Well, even though there will be trouble for Jacob, which is our next question, what will be the final result? Restoration of Israel and blessings of the new covenant. Okay, restoration of Israel and the blessings of the new covenant. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says the people shall be what? They will be delivered or rescued, right? Uh, they will be delivered. Um, so the same deliverance of Israel is, by the way, the same deliverance that is mentioned in Zechariah chapter 13 and verses 8 to 9, uh, where it talks about the third part of Israel being brought through the fire, refined as silver, and it refers to the remnant of Israel that will be spared as not joining in the blasphemy of, of, uh, of Christ according to Revelation 14 and verse 9 to 10. And so um, it is a great part of the picture that is being painted for us here in this particular chapter. As we move to the top of the next page in our questions in page 133, uh, in our workbooks, the question says, how does Jeremiah 30 verse 7 and uh, parallel with the description of Daniel 12 and verse 1? Now we have read those separately, but let's have someone... Uh, let's have them read again. So if someone can look up uh, Daniel 12, 1, and someone look up Jeremiah 30 and verse 1, and uh, let's have them both read back to back and then answer this question. So Daniel, uh, let's go Jeremiah 37 first. Okay. Uh, verse 7, it says, How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be a time of great of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. And Daniel 12, 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince and protector, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So what is the parallel between the two? It's a period of divine mercy. Trouble. Period of, time of trouble. period of time of trouble, but there's still something else that parallels the two. There, there, there's, there's a sense of being delivered in both of those texts, right, or being saved out of it. And that leads into the next question that we're asked on page 133. Uh, what do you find in Revelation 11, and we'll have these verses read in just a moment, that parallels with the two verses we just read? Uh, so let's have someone read Revelation 11, 25 to 27, and Romans. think about the ones, so I said Revelation, but Romans, right? Romans 11, 25 to 27, and think about the two passages that were just read. So just like a sword drill, first one that finds Romans 11, go ahead and read. For I would not rather that you would be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out a sign the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, 
when I shall take away their sin. Okay. So, based on what we just heard read in, in that passage in Romans, how does that passage now parallel with Daniel and Jeremiah? Uh, the common theme is that all Israel will be saved. Okay. So that there is a deliverance, all Israel. And this, this verse speaks specifically of using the word all Israel, but we're all, I think we're going to see also in context what that means in a few verses to come. Um, but it is part of the, the understanding that this focuses on the deliverance of not unbelievers because that's the day and age in which we live. We live in the day of grace, which is focused on unbelievers that this is the opportunity to be saved. This is speaking about a period of time which we know speaks about the tribulation period which focuses not on unbelievers but on uh, Israel. We have and two verses that go with that um, from previous study. Isaiah 59 verse 20 and 21. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. Thy people shall all be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. So that's the restoration of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. So salvation to Israel through the Redeemer, Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 16. Right. right. So based then on this lesson, how would you describe the book that is mentioned in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel 12 and verse 1. Now let's maybe go back and just revisit that, that, uh, that verse, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, because it may, we probably all read it and missed um, what the context was there. So it says, at the time... Shall Michael stand up, and the great pre, uh, prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since uh, there was an, was never since there was a nation even to the same time, and at that time a people shall be delivered, every one that is formed uh, shall be found written in the book. So now we're going to focus on the last word of that verse, the book. What do you think is the purpose of that book? Make the record of all those who put their faith and trust in Christ. Um, it's invaluable because it contains the names of those who will be saved. Close. Revelation 20, verse 12, 15 talks about books and one being the book of life. Right. This is referred to as the book of life. Now, keep in mind that Revelation speaks of two books. There's the book of life, and then there's the Lamb's book of life. The book of life is a book that records every name of every person who was conceived. So even as we believe as, as believers, according to Scripture, that a child in the womb is a living being. Every person is recorded in that book. Now, here's the, here's the, the immense thing about that is... Um, Especially for a child that is within the womb that does not come to fruition and actually live, that child is written in that book. But and God has recorded a name. What that name is, it's hard to say. But that that name is written. See, so the basis of this book is everyone that has had that has come to life that has been conceived, that has been given life. And so every name is pencil, it's, it, it's someone said it this way, it's like a book where every name is penciled in. But there comes a place where, uh, especially for believers in the day of grace, if a, if a person dies, that is the point in which their name is taken out of the book of life. Because they're no longer living. Their, their name is is we, the, the term is blotted out. 
Their name is blotted out. And there's, there's, a, there's a reference within Scripture that we're going to see here in a little bit too, that our names are blotted out because we do not believe in Jesus Christ. But when a person believes in Jesus Christ in the age of grace, it is often uh, illustrated that our names are, uh, in one sense, as, as a songwriter wrote, our names are written in red because they're now, they're now transcribed in the blood of Christ. And so they always will, be remain, will remain and not uh, be able to be blotted out. Um, but it ties in, and, and there, although there's not a lot of scripture that gives the finer details, at some point, the, I believe the scriptures teach that those uh, during this ter, uh, church age, those that receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, we are in the book of life, yes. And our name will remain there until the moment where we've died. But when we come to know Christ as our Savior, our names are written in a new book. Because this book speaks of a physical birth. The new book is the Lamb's book of life, which speaks of a, what, spiritual life. And so we are placed within that new book or that new uh, book of life. And, and we can see that as we look at the next question. It says, what insight into God's book do you find in Psalms 139, verse 16? So let's have someone read Psalms 139. In verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me uh, were written in your book before one of them came to be. Okay. So as you read that, it speaks to something I've already mentioned. What is it? What is it? It's speaking of a person within. Thou knowest my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book is all my members written, which in countenance were fashioned, when as yet was none of them. That's what I was referring to when I was talking about how even the infants within the womb of a mother are being part of this book or being written within this book, whether they are fully born into this world, they are still alive. They are still a human being. They are still a creation of God. So keep that in mind as we look at the next question because the next question takes us to Psalms 51 and verse 1, and it says, What action regarding God's book do we find in David's request in Psalms 51 verse 5, 51, sorry, 51 verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. So what action regarding God's book does this verse speak of? Right. Um, so it refers to the blotting out of his trans, uh, transgressions, uh, which indicates a record of sins. So we have a book of life, but we also have another book, a book of records, a book of our transgressions, a book of our sins. And so in the book of life, according to the scriptures, our names are blotted out when we come to... Um, the time of death. So they are in there and only those whose names are then written in the Lamb's book of life have eternal life in heaven because the Bible says if we don't have our names written in that book, we will, they will spend eternity in hell, right? But this is a book that is referring to a record of our sins and those that we have... Um, that which we have done wrong. And so David is illustrating this fact. God, would you not only, you know, have, we have the no desire to be in heaven, but forgive us of our sins and uh, forgive us our trespasses 
because we want our sins to be blotted out. Uh, we, that's the importance of confession, the importance of repentance, is that we confess those sins before God and have them forgiven. On the top of uh, page 134 in your workbooks, we go to uh, another question that David Jeremiah poses to us. And it, he says, what dramatic requests does Moses make then of God regarding the book in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 32? Um, but we're also going to look at verse 33. So if someone can read both verses, Exodus 32, verse 32 to 33. So what dramatic requests is Moses making before God here? You know what the context is? Remember Moses is looking upon the people of Israel and their wickedness. And as he sees their wickedness, he cries out to God in verse 32. Yet now if thou would forgive their sins, so he's talking about the people of Israel, and if not, if you don't want to forgive their sins, then blot me out. So it's, it's, Moses in a sense was saying, let me take their punishment and blot my name out of the, the book. Let me take their punishment. And so in that sense, it was a reference uh, to uh, a desire to die for the people of Israel. And it's interesting that that's there because it parallels with the reality of what God did for us in sending Jesus Christ into the world. Because Christ came to be our, what? Substitute. Our propitiation. He became our, took on our sin and died on, upon the cross. And so there is, there is a parallel there even uh, to the picture of what God desired to do for uh, for all of mankind. Here, Moses is picturing uh, this picture of um, uh, desiring to take uh, the place of the judgment of God for Israel and say, blot my name out. So when we think of that and go to the next question, we are asked in Daniel 12, verse 1, so going back to Daniel 12, 1, what does the last line about the book suggest about its context. Daniel 12, 1. What's the last line? But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Okay. What is that suggesting about its context? It's the case of all the names of all the believers. It contains the names of everyone? Not just... Just the believers. They're the ones that are saved. The only ones that will be delivered are the ones who are saved. So it's containing the names of those who have received and believed. He's asking us to consider the question, is every person recorded in the book? No. Because not everyone's believed or received. But yet he said previously that at conception, the name gets written. Yeah. Written. And I think part of the distinction here is when we read within scriptures and we read about different books, sometimes we don't understand which book it's talking about. Um, because we do know that the book of life rec records everyone that has lived, even those that live within the womb. What a great verse to prove against an abortionist that what's 
the life in the womb is a, is, is a living being. But the other book, the Lamb's Book of Life, that is more so recorded in Revelation, speaks of those whose names are been out of the book of life from death, the moment of death, they have been translated into, the, in the sense, the, the Lamb's Book of Life, and their names are, well, let me put it this way, their, their names aren't recorded there when they die. Their, their names are actually in two books uh, for a period of time, because uh, they're, in the Book of Life, their name is in there according to scriptures until they die. But then, at some point, people come to know Christ. So when I was nine years old and I trusted Christ as my Savior, when I, was, when I was in the womb, my name was written down. When I came to know Christ as my Savior, my name was written now in the Lamb's Book of Life. So those paralleled for a while until the moment that, that uh, until the moment either I die or I go home to be with the Lord. But the, the fact is, the, is that we don't focus on necessarily uh, the Book of Life but understand that the Lamb's Book of Life is more important. Um, is everyone in the Book of Life? Yes. Is everyone in the Lamb's Book of Life? No. Um, and that's what I think is part of what uh, David Jeremiah is trying to bring forth uh, through the balance of these verses that Daniel is portraying in the story. And so he asks us the next question, who will be then delivered or rescued by God for eternity in Daniel verse 1? Children of God's people. Right. So even though we've talked about, um, uh, and maybe that threw you off a little bit, we talked about everyone being in the book of life. The focus of this whole context is Israel or the people, the Hebrew people, the Jews. Um, they are also in, in, uh, in the book of life. Their names are written in that book of life. And so uh, those that will be delivered or rescued by God for eternity, according to this, will be also the people of Israel. They, don't, they, they didn't have the same opportunity uh, uh, that we have in what we call the age of grace, although... Jews can come to know the Lord, and there's many Messianic Jews today that believe on Jesus Christ, but the majority of Jews still have what the scripture says, blinders on, so that they would not see the reality of the Messiah that came, that they rejected, until the time of tribulation. Then their eyes will be open to who Jesus really was. And uh, so... This particular passage that Daniel is referring to is to referring to the ones that in that tribulation period will be able to recognize and see who Jesus really is and truly be saved. But we know that according to Roman, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 26, it speaks that only one third, one third of them will be brought through fire uh, it also parallels with Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9. A third of the people of Israel will come to believe in God during this tribulation period. So not all the names written in the Book of Life, whether they be Jew or Gentile, this is focused on now the people of Israel believing in Christ as their true Messiah during the tribulation period. But only one third of them will actually become believers. And so the focus is the people the, as, as a group, not necessarily the person. Uh, it's, it's the people. The next question that uh, we're asked here on page 134 is, what does Paul call the book in Philippians 4 verse 3? Let's look at that passage first in that first question. So let's go to New Testament, Philippians 4 verse 3. I entreat thee also to your fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with all, sorry, with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So again, we uh, Paul is referring to this particular book. He's talking about is what the book of life, life right? 
Philippians 4 verse 3, um, Jesus speaks of it in Revelation 3 verse 5 as what? Let's look at uh, Revelation, Revelation 3 verse 5. He who overcomes will, will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. Okay, so think, think closely now what we just heard. He's talking about the people of Israel that are written along with Jews and Gentiles alike in the book of life, anyone that has been given life in conception. But there's something different about the Jewish people. Those that truly believe in Christ during the tribulation period, the one-third of them, according to the scripture, that will be the remnant that believes in Christ, their names will not be what? Blotted out. Now, there's a difference there because they're believing in Christ not as Messiah, but as what? Do you remember? They're seeing Christ as the true King of kings and Lord of lords. So they recognize him as still a savior, but Israel is still seeing Christ as their Messiah in a conquering form um, and, or desiring uh, to see Christ as a conquering form. So the people of Israel here, their names, according to this text, who will not be blotted out where everyone else in the age of grace whose names, uh, who, who do not believe in Jesus Christ, their names will be blotted out because they believe not in Jesus Christ. And if unless their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will pass on to eternity into everlasting life in hell. And uh, here this passage is referring to Israel and them being not blotted out. Now let's look at the next question as we've got another whole page to go here. Um, what uh, does Paul, or no, where are we? Revelation 17, 2G. G. When were the names written in the book of life? Revelation 17 and verse 8. Now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. from the beginning. So how does one avoid having his name then blotted out of God's book is the next question on top of page 135. Acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God and accepting and believing. All right. By the simple term of being what? Born again. Understanding that even as we know uh, in, in the New Testament, um, we recognize that we are born of the flesh, but one must be born of the Spirit, Jesus Christ said, uh, been born again uh, to become a child of God. So salvation is open to all and is pending, humanly speaking. Those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life Revelation 21 verse 27 are the ones that have been born again. So how certain, and this is a personal question, how certain are you that your name is recorded in the book of life? Uh, what is the basis of your certainty? And remember the difference between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life. So according to the scripture this morning, we all should be certain that our names are recorded in the book of life. For whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
So that would then put us into the Lamb's Book of Life, right? So we're all in the Book of Life, but not everyone is in the Lamb's Book of Life until they believe, until they trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. So how could you best protect, uh, this is the question, how could you best protect the prophecy of Daniel and other prophets for the future? In your personal Bible reading, how much attention do you give to prophetic parts of the Bible? And um, this is one of those personal questions within our workbooks that it's important for us to at least personally uh, make a decision about. Um, but how, how can we best protect what we've heard throughout this whole study? Stay involved in the Bible. Right, we stay involved in the Bible and we live it out, right? We live out what we're learning. We live out what we, what we are in Christ. Um, but keep studying, keep understanding, keep living out uh, the teachings of the scripture and make it, um, in a sense, a present knowing, not a past knowing oh, that we've studied this and we have the knowledge of it, but a present knowing that we are studying this and we are learning of it. Um, and as we know the scriptures. I also think it's very important that we study together, not by ourselves only, because iron sharpens iron, and we need to hear each other speak about it. Yeah. And Jesus is glorified when we talk about it and amongst ourselves and share it. And that's why we have, that's what Sunday School was fashioned about. That's what the whole concept of Sunday School was. Not just a, a teacher proclaiming, but the interaction as a class, as to what are we learning? What, have, what are we discovering within the text that we're learning together? And so on the bottom of page 135, we have this last question. From your study of Daniel, how has this book accomplished the four purposes of scripture mentioned in 2 Timothy 3.16? So before we answer that, let's read that passage. Let's have someone turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and read verse 16. What are the four purposes of the scripture? All scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Okay. So the first area is? Teaching. Profitable for teaching, or for doctrine, which actually the word doctrine means to teach. So it's profitable for teaching, so it's important to teach it. The next one was what? Rebuking. Or rebuking or reproof. What, what does rebuking do? Correcting. Correction, right? It, it means to bring, to, to bring light, in a sense, to our conduct, to correct our conduct, um, to reprove. Because the, the next word is... Um, in the King James, it's doctrine, reproof, correction. What's the third one for? Correction. correction. So correction. Um, reproving means to bring to light the wrong. Correction means uh, to make what you've learned is right straight. To make straight or make right what you've learned is wrong. And then the fourth one is what? Training, any instruction. So it refers to education, doesn't it? Education. It's profitable for education. It's profitable so that we might know and understand uh, what the scripture says, but more so understand our relationship with God and to teach us how to serve Him. A good verse that goes with that is Proverbs 19.20 Hear counsel, receive instruction that you might be wise in the end. Okay. Very good. Especially in this time and day and age. Yeah. We need to know all we can. What was that reference again? Proverbs 19.20 Proverbs 19.20 Well, let's flip the page to 136. We've got two more questions here that... Uh, uh, we are to try to respond to this morning in our workbooks, and that is, how does Paul describe the results of the prophecy that is found in the 
1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. So let's first of all read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So how is he describing the results there? Right, and that helps answer how have we experienced those results from studying Daniel. Because here it says, the one that prophesies, or the one that speaks unto men, he speaks to men for the purpose of edification and exhortation and comfort. So edification, exhortation, and comfort are the results that are being described uh, by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 as to the prophecies that we have been looking at in Daniel. Uh, to edify, what does edify mean? Build up. Build up, right? To build up one another. Uh, 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 and we build up one another by exhorting one another. Um, and even we can bring in uh, the, the, the word uh, comfort. So to edify actually when you look at that scripture, is a, almost like a horn being blown to say, this is how you do it, and it gives the definition immediately. Exhort and comfort. When we edify, we edify by exhorting and comforting. And exhorting is a calling of someone alongside to help. It, it, it's not just to say, Thus saith the Lord, this is what you should do. When we are to exhort one another, we are to exhort one another in such a way that we say, let me come alongside you and actually show you how to do this. Let, let me come alongside you and actually walk with you and help you in this way. So the exalt is not just telling them what to do, but what? Showing them what to do. And the word comfort, we would look at that as to help, to strengthen, to, to uh, uh, not just edify by showing them what to do, but comfort them by uh, telling them that they have the ability to do this on their own, to, to encourage, strengthen. So we tidy this all up with the last question uh, on page 136 by um, answering how have you prepared for your rest? Um, how hopeful are you in arising uh, from your inheritance? And in order to understand that, we've got to go to the last verse of Daniel, uh, chapter 12. What is the rest that he is referring to? Daniel chapter 12 in verse 13. Someone read that. As for you, go your way to the end. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. So, how do we put that into action? How do we, how, how do we prepare for our rest? I've got a verse uh, Revelation. 14, 13, that helps with that. It says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Okay. Because when you think of the word rest, what is... It's referring to death. Is it referring to death in that verse? It is. Yeah. It is referring to, it, it, this rest that it's referring to is, is the rest that we finally receive from, uh, it, it's the eternal rest that we, that we have in Christ. And so how are we preparing for our eternal rest? Um, what some have referred to as the Eden rest, or the rest uh, that we have of God uh, when he completes his creation 
in the millennial uh, kingdom. How are we preparing for that rest? Knowing that our, you know, we're studying about spiritual warfare and that we're in a battle and, and we talked about Daniel chapter 10 this morning and, and a little bit about the battle between Satan, uh, Satan's archangel and, and God's archangel and, and all of those things uh, concerning the battle of, of spiritual life. But here in the, in the balance of this, it's speaking about not just the rest of the spiritual battle, but the rest of that we will have in Christ, even of the physical challenges that we have gone through in life. And we are one day find our rest in God, in heaven, and uh, in the millennial kingdom. So I wrote down uh, the, the song that came to my mind as I was reflecting on that verse, uh, was the song that we've, sung, that we've heard in church uh, before, and we'll sing it again. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's the rest that it's speaking about. The rest that we have because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, not just in the book of life. Let me conclude by reading a few statements uh, from David Jeremiah as his reflection on this last chapter. As we come to the end of the book of Daniel, we too can follow three directions that were given to Daniel in this last chapter of prophecy. First of all, protect the prophecy. Daniel was told to seal up the prophecy and preserve it for the future day when it would be needed. That instruction was given to Daniel more than 2,500 years ago. We have been blessed to study the book of Daniel because it has been what? Preserved. And now it's our turn. How can we preserve the words of Daniel's prophecy? We can read them, we can study them, determine to understand them, and even obey them. We can teach our children the importance of understanding the prophetic sections of the scripture, and we can encourage our pastors and teachers to explain these truths to us. Someday soon the Lord is going to return for his saints. And immediately the prophecies we have studied here in Daniel will begin to unfold as the seven years of tribulation begin. Future events cast their shadows before they become a reality. In other words, the events of the tribulation will be unloosed after the rapture. But to those who know their Bibles, the build-up to those events will be the evident before them. So as God's people, we must be vigilant. And then he quotes from Romans 13, verses 11 to 14. He then says, proceed with life. So not just protect the prophecy, but proceed with life. In response to one of Daniel's questions, Gabriel told him the answer would be revealed at the appointed time and that it was all headed, or sorry, all needed to know. Daniel wasn't to waste the time in pursuit of the answer, but rather to get on with life. While prophecy is important and we should never neglect it, neither should it be an obsession to the exclusion of our service to the Lord. Daniel was told not to sit by and wait for the fulfillment of the prophecies, but to go his way and serve the Lord. And the angel told Daniel that those who teach the word and share the gospel would shine like the stars forever and ever. Daniel 3, 12, verse 3. As I read that verse, I am reminded of something I wrote in the introduction of the book of Daniel in Jeremiah's study Bible. In the Jeremiah study Bible. It challenged me then and it still does now. Contemporary culture loves the idea of stars. We have star musicians, singers and actors, athletes, and others who become stars simply because they are wealthy or glamorous. This sort of stardom hangs by the most tenuous of threads. Yesterday's stars are often today's has-beens. The book of Daniel, however, speaks of a genuine vision. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, 3. Most of us will probably never live to see our names in lights. But if we pursue and apply the wisdom of God's word, 
as best as we know how, live our lives to the point where outwardly towards, uh, sorry, live our lives to the point others would tor uh, toward Christ, we will somehow reflect the beauty and, gl and glory, lighting up the skies of the new heaven and new earth. He says, not just to proceed with life, but prepare for the future. Daniel was told to go his way till the end. For he would rest and arise to his inheritance at the end of days. In other words, he was promised something far better in the future. And so are we alike. Like Daniel, we are promised a glorious future if we pour, put our trust in the Lord and his presence. Like the teachers and the evangelists of the end times, we have the potential to shine like the stars in the new kingdom of Jesus Christ. As we close our extended study of this book of Daniel and the Babylon, agents of Babylon, I cannot think of no better way, he says, to summarize all that we have learned by quoting my friend Warren Worsby. And this is what he said. Mention the name of Daniel among the people who read the Bible and you will get a variety of responses. Prophecy students will say an inspired interpreter. Businesses, business people will reply he was also an efficient administrator. A youth pastor might say he was a model of a great young man and the prayer warriors will add, but don't forget he was faithful to intercede. These assessments are true, but behind them is the most important characteristic of all. Daniel was a conqueror. In fact, he was a more than conqueror kind of person who believed God and became an overcomer. George Washington Carver said that success is measured not only by where people end up in life, but also how much they do to overcome to get there. Daniel had to meet and overcome many enemies and ob obstacles in order to survive and continue serving the Lord and his people in a pagan kingdom. The story of Daniel is fascinating, said G. Campbell Morgan, because it reveals the possibilities of godliness in the midst of circumstances of ungodliness. You see, Daniel was a teenager when he was taken to Babylon in 605 BC, and he served successfully for at least 60 years under four different Gentile rulers, where Jeremiah was hoping the poor remnant in Judah and Ezekiel was encouraging the exiles in Babylon. Daniel was at the center of the political power bearing witness of one true and living God. He was serving the Lord by witnessing to the lost, advising the king, and writing the book that today teaches God's people. He did work. He did his work faithfully, and God honored him. And that is the end. Uh, Brother Dale, would you close our Sunday school time in prayer? Uh,